streaming. I'm going to go ahead and start this about six minutes early because I'm probably not going to go the full hour today. Let me start my timer so I can keep track. Um, I apologize for not being here last week. Last week was kind of crazy. I was in North Dakota and South Dakota and um, doing some doing some project work there. And uh, I wound up getting a uh, like getting a crazy sinus infection that migrated into both of my eyes. So I have what's called bilateral bacterial conjunctivitis, which I think is just a fancy word for pink eye. And it has been horrible. I had to drive back to my home, which is about two hours south of Memphis, Tennessee. And so I was driving yesterday with what could only be described as compromised um, vision, which was no fun. Um, let me stay over here on the deal here and see if there's anybody else. Let's see, my companion, share your screen. I'm not sure if I'm even, right, let me see here. Okay, now the, uh, uh, and so I'm like on cold medicine for the sinus thing and the eye thing, and so I'm a little bit fuzzy to say the least. Um, but let's see. All right, so we got one person here so far. So anyway, we'll just kind of cruise into things. Um, I'm hoping that we make sure we're good on YouTube. Um, for those who are watching this or who may watch future episodes or whatever, I try to stream live every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Central. We usually do this for about an hour. Um, if you can't watch it, um, if you can't watch it live, I either simulcast or then I upload to the YouTube channel. Southern Exposures Photography is the name of that. Um, and if you are in our Facebook group, which is, um, let's see here, let's see here, live, let's see what we got. I just want to make sure this is, this is working correctly, and I'm not sure it is. Um, anyway, we'll figure that out. If it's not streaming simultaneously to YouTube, um, I'll make sure that it gets uploaded so we've still got a few people coming in. We got about three minutes until the um, official start time. So I tell you what we'll do. Um, we will go to here, um, and I'll just run through here and look at a couple of the comments that I noticed were in the Facebook group, and, and I'll just do my best to answer those um, right now while we wait for other people to join. Um, if you are in the lobby and you're trying to join, I'll pop back over here occasionally and make sure. I got the plug-in to auto-approve or whatever, and I haven't been able to get that set up yet. Last week was just really, was really hectic. Um, so anyway, let's see. Uh, Robert Myrick says, new question. I completely changed my website from general photography to specifically boudoir about four months ago. Uh, but kept my domain. Here I am four months later still ranking for keywords that have not been on my site for four months. Will they eventually fall off? And if so, how long will that take? Um, uh, yes, they will. And, and here's the thing. The more blog content you post on your website, the more frequently you update your website, the more frequently Google is going to come back and visit your website. So if you made the change four months ago and you really haven't done anything to attract the attention of the Google spider bots, then it may take some time. They may have you on a six month review cycle. Uh, it, it really depends on what frequency you've been adding and updating new content. So my suggestion to you would be blog every day. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about using some AI resources and stuff like that in order to make your job easier. 
the more frequently you blog, the more attention Google, the more attention you're going to attract from Google and the more uh, frequency they're going to allocate to you. So just keep that in mind. Um, I say blog daily. I'm not able to accomplish that myself just because of life things, but I would say blog as frequently as you possibly can. And, and also to include in that, let me check our check our waiting room here, make sure we don't have people waiting. Nope. Um, I will add into that, be sure that you um, know that page updates and stuff also count as blogging. And we're going to talk about that in a moment because we went through and did some updates to our boudoir site. And I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about some of that. So anyway, we're, we're at the top of the hour, which means we're officially now into our 11 o'clock SEO accountability slash training uh, gr weekly group meeting. I'm sorry, uh, cold medicine and stuff's got me quite a bit groggy today. Um, but we're going to talk about several different things here. Um, you think my microphone is muted. Well, that sucks. Okay, let's see here then. Why would that be happening? Um, let's see. So I'm showing that I have audio there. Let's go back to Teams. This is a learning experience for me because I only do this obviously once a week. All muted. No, let's see here. Um, admit. So really quickly, if you if you can hear me, I guess drop a thing in the chat over here and, and let me know. Because um, let's see here. Yep, still unable to hear. Okay, all right. Let me figure out what the heck is going on. Where would that even be? Maybe here, settings, um, general video, general. Additional, leave empty, reactions, video. So why is it not showing me any audio options on here? Okay, hang on a sec. Let me see. <clears throat> Let's see here. No audio is always fun. Let's see. Nope, that's showing that my audio is working there. So this must be a... This must be... A, this must be a Google Meet thing. Host controls, activities, chat, show everyone. All right, I'm at a loss here about why it's not showing, why it's not showing audio, because it doesn't even show my microphone as an option here. General, nope. Captions, reactions. All right, guys, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna close, you, you won't know this. I'm gonna close out and restart. All right, let's close that. Let's go to here. All righty, let's see here. All right, let's see if this helps any. So you guys let me know if you can hear now. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, that's working. I don't know, whatever. So all of that I just said was spoken to no one. <laughs> the people on YouTube will get to hear it because this was a Google Meet thing. Um, so here's the deal, guys. Last week, um, I was in North Dakota and South Dakota doing some content production work for um, a different company, and I contracted a sinus infection, which migrated up into my eyes, and I have bilateral bacterial conjunctivitis, which is a fancy word for saying I got pink eye in both eyes. So if you can imagine having little shards of glass in your eyes, so they burn constantly and they're constantly watering and it's gross. Um, but I started medication when I got back home, and so I am actually feeling better. But last week was a no-go for me for a couple different reasons, and I appreciate you guys uh, understanding 
on that. Um, so um, let's just bounce back really quickly. So we're, we're well into the top of the hour. Um, I want to talk about... Um, I want to talk about content production, and one of the things that I want to talk to you guys about, and I mentioned this before, it's super important that you blog on a regular basis, and I say blog daily, and, and that's almost hypocritical because I know I'm not able to do that, um, but I do encourage you to blog with regularity. Um, Robert Myrick posted in the group, basically his question was, hey, uh, you know, I made some changes to my website four months ago, but I'm still getting search engine placement for, for terms that haven't been on my website for a number of months. The reason for that is Google only allocates resources to pages that deserve it. And one of the ways that you can deserve more allocation from Google is to update your website frequently, blog daily, or at least make some changes to original, to to page content that's on there. So when Google comes back, they see that there's been activity, so they will come back sooner. Robert, to answer your question, I'm guessing that they probably have you on a six month uh, spidering schedule. And the solution to that is just to start dropping new content, you know, get stuff out there on a regular basis and you will find that, um, that your refresh rate is a bit shorter on that. And with that in mind, you can see on the page here, this is a notification that I got from Google um, letting me know that my website, luxboudoir.studio, which is my um, dedicated boudoir site, received 15 search engine visits uh, in the previous 28 days. Is that exciting? Well, it's exciting for me because prior to that, this site was receiving no search engine uh was receiving no search engine traffic. And so receiving 15 in a month is a good thing. And I'm going to show you here. Um, so you can see I'm not, I'm, you know, like I have life and I have appointments and I have sessions and stuff. So I'm obviously not blogging daily, um, but I am getting some content out there. And so the very first blog post that got picked up by Google was one that I had written on January 2nd. And if you will look at the little badge that they sent me, this period was ended on January 29th. So between January 2nd and January 29th, Google picked up enough blog posts that the site started generating search engine traffic, which I think is, which I think is very, very, um, very important because that tells me that Number one, it tells me that the site is being spidered on a regular basis, at least once in 28 days, which is, which is good. And it also tells me that the content that I'm producing is content that Google is, um, is accepting as legitimate. And I'll tell you why that's important here in just a moment. We are going to pop right back over here and I'm going to to show you the, the content that I produced. Now, this blog post right here was done completely in AI. And I did this as, a, as an experiment, and I'll show you what I use. Most of you are probably familiar with ChatGPT. If you're not familiar with ChatGPT, I recommend that you get familiar with it because this is the golden age of automatically or quasi automatically generated content. And this is the problem that we're running into with it right now. Um, it's emerging technology and they have not scaled this up yet to meet the demand that people are presenting with it. And all I can tell you is check back. It's obviously easier to get on during non prime time hours. I find that in the evenings I'm able to get on eight, nine, 10 o'clock central time. And I know you're like, Jason, I don't want to be doing blogging at 10 o'clock at night. Right now, that's the best free resource that's available. There are some paid resources. I haven't delved into any of those because I'm using this one and I wanted to see if the content that comes from it is, um, 
is appealing to Google. And so the only thing I can tell you is just keep checking back with it. And uh, when you get into it, uh, you know, use it, pound out as many articles as you can while your window of opportunity is open. I'll tell you how I do it. Um, I've got my list of a dozen key phrases that I use and by my office computer I just have a couple yellow sticky notes on the side of my monitor and when I go to write write a blog post um, I pull out three of those key phrases and this is what I plug into chat GPT. Write a 500 word blog post about fill in the blank whether I'm writing for Valentine's for Boudoir bridal boudoir, um, whatever, the, whatever the, um, the topic that I'm covering is, I make sure that I put that in there and then I'll say using the following key phrases and literally it takes it about 45 seconds to, to produce that blog post and that's literally what I'm using to plug into um, my blogs and then obviously I have used both um, content on my website I only use content that I create but then on some external stuff on some blogger blogs and stuff that I'm doing I will use some AI generated images and I use an app on my phone called Starry AI I'm sure there's some better ones out there but I just started using that one and and I'm familiar with it so I use it and what I'll do is I'll say you know create image of beautiful brunette in boudoir style or whatever. And it'll, it creates like five or six images or whatever. And usually two or three of those are worth using and two or three of them are a little wonky. Um, and I've been plugging those in. I don't have any results on those yet. So I can't really, um, I can't really comment about how effective the images are. Cause like I said, I don't have, um, I don't have, data on that but as data comes through on that I will definitely let you guys know um, so sort of my my goal for this meeting was to oh maybe chat GPT is going to give me a window of opportunity now man it looks like I'm going to be able to log in and I'll show you guys quickly I was going to say this is going to make for a really short video since uh, I can't get into chat GPT, but maybe it's going to let me in. I think it is. All right, so let me go back over here, switch to this so you guys can see what's going on. So this is how I would do it. And I know some of you guys are already doing this. Um, about... Um, I can't type and talk at the same time. I apologize. All right, so this is what I've got. I have got, and spelling counts, Jason, even on the internet. Um, so this is why I told it. Write a 600 word post. I'm, I'm changing this to blog post because I don't know if that changes how it does things or not. Write a 600 word blog post about couples boudoir photography using the following key phrases. And the key phrases that I have chosen are professional boudoir, boudoir for him, and boudoir photography in Mississippi. And this is just typical of what I would do. Um, and let's time this really quickly and see how long it takes this thing to create a 600 word blog post. And you guys saw about how fast I can type. I'm not the world's fastest typist. So for me to come up with a 600 word blog post would probably take me about, I'd say 10 minutes maybe. Um, you can do the math on that. I would say I probably average about 115 words a minute. So you can do just straight typing, not the thinking and all that part. You know, I would say 10 minutes is probably an accurate number for how long it would take me to do that. And so we're approaching 38 seconds here. Um, 
And I think maybe some of the time it takes to do this is related to the amount of people who are using it. Because I've done this before. We're at 50 seconds now. I've done this before and it would take about 41 to 45 seconds. So some of that's probably related to how many people are on the system at any given time. And also I think it relates to how complex your instructions are. Because uh, if you give it fairly simple instructions, I think it can do it faster if it has to think more which I guess that makes sense or whatever. So we're into this um, in conclusion. So it's doing the last paragraph. We're into this a minute and 20. And it should be wrapping up here pretty quickly. Okay, so a minute and 28 seconds in order to produce this content that I believe Google is accepting as, as legitimate um, natural natural language uh, text. Years ago, Google developed a system called the Latent Semantic Index. And what that was is it's an algorithm that they used to determine if text on a page was, was organic, meaning it was done by a human. Because there are a lot of rudimentary text generators out there. Um, so Google has over the years factored into their algorithm, is this text organic? It was this text written by a human or was it machine generated? And I don't think they can tell the difference between this. And they shouldn't be able to because it really reads like great content or good content anyway. Some of it requires editing. Um, but that's what I use in order to create um, a quick blog post. And, and then I just plug it in. This particular one, um, I didn't even plug any images into it because it was one of the first ones that I had done. But all of these blog posts that I have entered in over the last month or so um, were done using artificial intelligence generated uh, text. And sometimes I would vary them for, from 400 words, 500 words, 600 words. So that part is, um, check over here, oh, we're good. So that part is, in my opinion, good evidence that the Googlebots are accepting AI-generated text, which is good for us because it, it, just, it just makes it easier for us to do things, right? So anyway, with, with, with that said, and I'm not going to dig into that any deeper than just to tell you guys, use it if you're not using it already. Um, use it whenever you find a window of opportunity to sort of keep you a list of five or six or eight topics that you want to uh, generate content for and plug them in as quick as you can and, and get that content sort of stored up, if you will. And then you can, you can insert it into your blogs as we go forward. Now, the thing that I wanted to talk about this week that I have not had an opportunity to do because of the health situation and stuff that I've talked about before was I wanted us to talk about... Um, I want us to talk about using internal um, internal advertising on our blog posts and on our websites. This is not something that we think about a lot. And what I'm talking about when I say internal advertising, I'm talking about using ad space on your website just like you would use ad space on, or just like other websites use ad space to direct traffic. So let's think about these blog posts for a moment. These blog posts are, are almost 100%, I'm gonna say 98% for search engine rankings only, okay? While they are readable for your average human animal, they're not really gonna motivate humans to take action. And, and I can also tell you this, unless you have an insanely engaged and highly targeted audience, they're not going to read a 600 word blog post. It's just not going to happen. If you look at heat maps, which are, which is technology you can install on your website that will allow you to see where people spend the most time, where their mouse movements go, what pay, what sections of your website are on screen for the longest, you'll find that about one scroll is all people are going to do. They're not going to get to the bottom of your website unless they are just really, really 
engaged in what it is that you're presenting. So that means that we need to assume that they're not going to make it to the call to action if that's the last part of your blog post. So we need to direct that traffic because we can assume that each one of these blog posts is going to be its own landing page. So what do we want people to do when they land on this page? So this particular page is about, um, let me make sure I've got this up for you guys. This particular page is about bridal boudoir photography. Okay. So next week when you guys come in, I will have added some banner ads into this. I say banner ads. I will have added some internal advertising to get people to do what I want them to do when they land on this page. So what is that that I want them to do? I want them to give me contact information so that I can turn around and I can market to them outside of Google or Facebook or wherever they are spending their time on, on online. Meaning I need to get their name, I need to get their email address, and I really, really need to get their phone number. And we'll talk about designing some landing pages. I'm going to try to divide next week into creating and implementing banners and then designing landing pages because that that's vitally important. We can never assume that people are going to land on a page and know what to do or even do what it is that we want them to do. So we've got to use some mechanisms in order to guide them. And so banners are what we're going to use on the page to get people to go where we want them to go. And then that landing page is where we're going to get our conversions. I recommend that you guys think about one of my favorite things to use on landing pages is what is called a lead hook. And that is simply a trade for their information. Everything that we do as marketers is a transaction. So we need to keep that in mind. What am I giving you that is either at equal or greater value than what you're giving me? <clears throat> Excuse me. What you're giving me is contact information. What am I giving you that is going to be beneficial for you in order for us to have that transaction? In order for you to give me that contact information, I need to be giving you something that is of equal or greater value. I like lead hooks. I like things that have very um, click baity, I guess, if that's a word, uh, titles to it because I think those things help people, help motivate people. So think about things like um, the top five things your stylist want, doesn't know <clears throat> about bridal boudoir photography. Um, you know, Top five. I like top five because it doesn't take any, you should be able to come up with five bullet points and some little descriptors on anything that has to do with your business, right? 10 is a little much. Um, so five or seven or whatever, people seem to respond better to five. And we, we've talked about before, I subscribe to this idea that there is this that there is this brain thing that people have called the rule of seven plus or minus two. Um, five is on the lower end of that. It applies to a lot of things. We've talked about how it applies to our phone number structure in the United States. If you'll think about that, you know, our phone numbers are designed for us to think about seven, right? Without the area code, our phone numbers are seven digits, right? And so, and it's also broken into segments. One, you know, 601, 222, blah, 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 right? So, so that is a real thing in our brains. So when I think about presenting lead hooks to people, I want to err on the lower side of that, you know, 10 things, 12 things, that might be too much for people. They might look at that and go into overwhelm mode and not fill out your contact information just simply because 10 is too many or 12 is too many or whatever. So I found that five works well for a variety of reasons. It's easier to create. I think it's more appealing to people in a headline. For some strange reason, odd numbers um, attract our attention more than even numbers. If you think about that, look at the way that things are priced in stores and they usually end in odd numbers. For whatever reason, that is more attractive to us than even numbers, and I don't know why. Um, so we're gonna assume that five is the magic number, so to speak. 
And so think about lead hooks that you can create that revolve around that, right? Five great, five great boudoir, five great bridal boudoir style tips for spring 2023. Um, you know, and then as you move past spring, you can simply change that to fall 2023, right? So if you're looking to book spring brides, that's going to resonate with them. And so then you just create a simple PDF that's auto delivered to people using whatever system you guys want to. Most every, most every um, uh, email system, Mailchimp, uh, Constant Contact, depending on what you're using, most of those things allow you to do that. Um, you know, you can even use tools in Google if you're using uh, Zapier. If you guys are not using Zapier and you're not familiar with that, take a look at it, zapier.com. It's a process automation thing. It plugs into basically every top shelf system that's out there. You know, I, I think their entry level price or whatever is like 20 bucks a month. And you can use that to do automation stuff. In fact, when you guys send me your email address, I just go and plug it into a Google spreadsheet that says um, SEO marketing group and when I plug it into there I have a zap that runs that automatically sends you guys the welcome email and stuff so it works out well for me process automation I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a nerd and if I have to do things more than twice I want to automate a system to handle that so literally you can have people send have the form information sent to Gmail and then you can have a zap that goes in and extracts their information from Gmail, plugs it into a Google Sheet, and then uses Gmail then to generate a response back to them with whatever attachment that you want. And you can keep your leads then categorized by what lead hook they got. So if they got the, you know, the top five things your hairdresser will never tell you before your boudoir session or whatever your little spammy clickbaity title is, you can keep track of how many people are, are subscribing to each one of those lead hooks. And so we're getting a little bit deeper into the weeds on what we'll talk about next week when it comes to um, form generation. And But be thinking about that and, and, and be creating them too. So think about, you know, if you were targeting bridal boudoir for the spring, what are the five bullet points that you would use for that? And then you just create a simple little uh, PDF for that, and then that's your exchange. That's what you're giving them as an exchange for value um, against their contact information. And I will say this, be very careful with how you are, don't abuse your list. And I can tell you this from experience, your email responses are probably going to be way less than your potential responses from text messages. And, we're, and we'll talk about how to create a form that helps you sort of overcome some of these hurdles. But how many of you guys are in Facebook groups where the group owners abuse the at everyone tag? I'm in one group and I promise you it's like every day I'm getting a message that has the at everyone tag. And unless your group is providing some insanely valuable information, that can kill your group faster than anything you could possibly imagine because I don't want direct messages from your group. If I know, if I want something from it, I know where to go and find it. So people who are abusing that are doing themselves a tremendous disservice. Um, you have to come up with other ways to organically build engagement in your group versus force feeding people stuff that may not be relevant to them. And that's what I'm finding. So keep that same idea in mind about text messaging. Text messaging is going to be your best response medium, but it's also going to be one that can cause you a lot of problems because with most ways to communicate, if you get enough people that flag your text message as spam, that door is going to be closed to you. And so if that's a phone number that you use for other business related communication, if it gets blocked on, on Google or, or rather if it gets blocked on uh, Verizon or AT&T or T-Mobile or whatever, and you can no longer deliver text messages through that network, as you can see, that's a bad thing. So you have to be very, very careful with that. But we'll talk about that next week when we talk about ways to design forms that are both going to be that are going to be highly converting and that are also going to provide you with the information that you need. So we're certainly going to talk about that next week as well as 
um, talk about uh, ways to create on-site ads using Canva. I'll, I'll go ahead and give you guys a spoiler alert. We'll be using Canva next week. So if you have some time between now and then, and you're not, if you're one of the people who's never used Canva, um, how is that even possible? <laughs> I think everyone has probably ex been exposed to Canva on some level or not by this point. Log on, canva.com, simple as that. Familiarize yourself with it because we are going to be using that extensively. Um, and it's a no-brainer. If you haven't used it, um, it'll make you look like a graphic design genius because you can create um, you can create professional graphics for free. Their free service is really robust. Um, and obviously they have a pro version as well that gives you access to some additional resources. But honestly, for what we're going to be doing, I think you can do 99% of what you would need to do um, with their free version. And if you're, if you're handy with, with Adobe Illustrator, um, Photoshop, and stuff like that, you can probably create these graphics on your own. Um, again, they're no-brainers. I would recommend that you go and look up Google banner ad sizes and familiarize yourself with those because we're going to be following their standard on that. I believe that they've been doing banner advertising for long enough that they probably know more than I do about why certain sizes of banner ads work better than other things. So instead of, instead of um, reinventing the wheel, we're just going to defer to their wisdom on that. So if you guys want to prepare for next week, and I'm going to be wrapping this up because my eyeballs are burning like you could not believe, re-wrapping this up. So I'm just going to point out really quickly, get on chat GPT, generate as much content as you possibly can while the window of opportunity is open. Um, it works. Google is indexing it. It's bringing search engine visitors to my website. And so I'm going to be devoting many, many more resources to using that tool just simply because it's free, it's effective, it's quick. Um, you know, it's doing what I want it to do. Now it's my job to direct that traffic that's coming in to a place where I can capitalize on it. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Bang out as much GPT content as you can. Get on, go get on, go get on Google and make a list of the banner ad sizes because um, we're going to, that's what we're going to be using as a guideline to create banners in Canva or Illustrator. Most of what I'm going to be talking about is going to be focused on Canva because I know a lot of people out there uh, use Lightroom exclusively, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love Lightroom. In fact, I'm transitioning myself from Capture One over into using Lightroom more. Um, but if you're a Lightroom only person, sometimes Photoshop and certainly Illustrator can be a little bit intimidating, and there's quite a steep learning curve where those are concerned. So I want to, I don't want to use, I don't want to say dumb it down in an insulting way, but I do want to make it as easy as possible for newbies and people who are not um, well versed in the other Adobe products so that they can get up and running quicker. Obviously the best thing that you can do is create 100% original uh, banner ads using Photoshop and Illustrator just because that's better than using sort of canned stuff but we're going to start with the canned stuff because it'll be effective. And then we're also going to talk about creating um, effective landing pages so familiarize yourself with how would you handle the back end of that with your current um, with your current email list handling system, whatever that is? And if you don't have one, I'm going to talk to you guys about how I do mine. I covered that a little bit. Um, like I said, I use Zapier for process automation, and then I use the free Google Gmail sheets and stuff like that in order to keep my data in one place. So that's how I'm going to present it to you guys. As with everything I tell you, that's my way of doing it. It's not the way or even the best way to do it. It's just how I do it. And so if you can find a better way to, you know, if you can find, if you can build a better mousetrap, by all means, share it with the group because there'll be some other people who can benefit from that as well. And maybe I would. Um, keep on keeping on. Um, I know some of you guys have sent me messages, you know, about, you know, the, the systems so far are working for you guys. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, obviously, if you guys are not subscribed to the Southern Exposures Photography YouTube channel, please do that. It just it just helps me get content out to people. Um, you know, I, the, the cliche term, like, comment, subscribe, share, whatever. 
Feel free to reach out to me if there's something that you guys want to cover that I haven't mentioned or you think something is, you know, of greater importance than what I'm talking about. Um, let me know. I want to answer your questions in the best way that I can, um, you know, because I want us all to grow here. So at this point, I think I'm going to go ahead and sign off and go put some drops in my eye and try to recover a little bit. Hopefully, I'll be in better position next week because we've got a lot to cover. So I want to try and catch up on stuff that we missed last week. I appreciate you guys. I really do. Um, you know, I hope that, you know, my odd ramblings can help you guys grow in your business. Um, and, and that's why I'm here. Just, you know, because it's, it's every time I teach you something that I know, I learn a little bit more about it. And I appreciate that, guys. So with that said, I'm going to sign off. For those of you guys who are watching this on simulcast or on archive, we're doing this every week, um, life allowing uh, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Central Time, we will be live on Google Meet. Uh, the link is in the uh, Marketing for Photography group on Facebook. I will include some links to that below this video for those of you who are on YouTube. I recommend that you join the group. Ask questions in there. That's always good. I think that hive knowledge is probably one of the best things that we have and one of the greatest things about the Internet is we get to access sort of the collective pool of wisdom and knowledge and i like that i think it's a good thing otherwise you guys have a great week um you know keep on blogging keep on doing what you're doing um i love you guys and i'll see you next time